What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi Shrinks and Sneakers.com. So before I get into my discussion for today's topic, I want you guys to consider liking and subscribing to the channel as it helps me to continue making psychiatry great again. So that's my pitch and now I'm gonna dive right into the topic and this is one that people have been requesting from me for a while. So I'm finally ready to tackle it after all this time and that is what is the evidence for medication use in borderline personality disorder. So what we're talking about here is not medication use for comorbidities in borderline personality disorder. What is the evidence to support the use of medication itself for the treatment of borderline personality disorder? So this is a controversial topic, a little bit of a dirty topic in psychiatry, but I'm gonna do justice to this topic and I'm gonna give you the most up-to-date research and evidence regarding the medications that can be used for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. What about the second messenger drugs or anti-epileptics or quote unquote mood stabilizers, a term I don't really like very much, but let's talk about them because they are important here. A study found that with carbamazepine, 600 milligrams per day actually decreased behavioral discontrol in 60% of borderline personality disorder patients. So that's nice. That's a pretty big effect size. 60% of people with BPD in that study on 600 milligrams of carbamazepine a day actually had better behavioral control versus placebo. So that's encouraging. And I've already said that these medications, these anti-epileptics, mood stabilizers, they, are ha they have the largest overall effect size in the treatment of borderline personality disorder. So if I was gonna prescribe one medication, it would likely be in this class. How about Depakote or Divalproics? Depakote had mixed results, but there is some benefit for reducing anger, reducing aggression, and reducing impulsivity. And we know in borderline personality disorder that anger, aggression, and impulsivity are things that can get our patients into trouble, and, and they are symptoms that can be very distressing that the patient may want to reduce. So Divalprox also has some benefit. I said before that the two that really stand out are Topiramate and Lamotrigine, and that remains true. Now what's interesting to me is I believe from my research and my literature review that topiramate actually is not a mood stabilizing medication and does not work well in bipolar disorders. So if I have a patient with bipolar disorder, I never use topiramate and I, I will sometimes continue it if the patient finds it beneficial, but I generally will not be the one to start it. But Interestingly here, in borderline personality disorder, it appears that topiramate 200 to 500 milligrams per day actually does a pretty good job at decreasing the, the symptoms of anger, impulsivity, and sensitivity, emotional sensitivity. So topiramate has some real evidence here and is a good choice for a patient with borderline personality disorder if you want to prescribe a quote unquote mood stabilizing drug. And finally, lamotrigine at 200 milligrams per day was, known to, was seen to decrease anger substantially. So again, if anger, impulsivity are big issues, topiramate, lamotrigine, depakote, and carbamazepine may also have some benefit. You might be asking me, what about the dopamine blocking medications or so-called antipsychotics? If you're dealing with borderline personality disorder or if you're, one of, if you're a practitioner or a psychiatrist, then you've likely seen patients on dopamine blocking medications. So what can we say about those medications and how can they potentially be helpful for someone with borderline personality disorder? So dopamine blocking medications may enhance cognition or cognitive function through 5-HT7 antagonism. So blocking that serotonin 5-HT7, that actually might enhance cognition for these patients. Blocking D2 receptors, right? That's the standard way these medications work. That's how all of these medications currently work with the exception of a couple that I'll talk about, that I've already talked about in other places. But let's just say most of the traditional antipsychotic dopamine blocking medications are going to block D2 receptors. And that can improve perceptions, so perceptual disturbances, hallucinations, etc. It can dampen aggression, right? It can reduce aggression. It can also improve abnormal mood elevation. So if the person, and it's not, with borderline personality disorder, it's not like mania. It's very different than mania, but there could still be this abnormal mood elevation, and this can be helped with dopamine blockade. It can also help 
with impulsive behavior. So blocking DUT receptors sometimes helps reduce impulsivity. And you have to watch for the increased side effect profile. So remember these medications are not without side effect and you have to be careful when you're prescribing them that when you're doing so, the patient understands the risks and benefits and that they have symptoms that are going to be targeted by this medication. I wanna show this little piece here from the Good Psychiatric Management for Borderline Patients. And I wanna show kind of an algorithm-based decision-making tree that you can go through if you're treating one of these patients. So at the beginning, if the symptoms are mild, I would recommend not starting a medication and that's also their recommendation here. So if, you're, if the symptoms are mild, not really impairing the person's function, then you can go with psychotherapy techniques. If you could find someone who performs DBT or even CBT for that matter, you can, you know, and mentalization therapy. There's a few other types of therapy that can be helpful for borderline personality disorder. But if you could find someone that does good psychotherapy, that would be my starting point. But let's say the opposite is true. Let's say the symptoms are really severe and you got to do something. Well, then what you want to do is you want to think about the specific symptoms that the patient is having. Are they having affective instability, right? Are they having impulsivity or anger, right? Are they having cognitive or perceptual disturbances? So if they're having impulsivity and anger, you're looking at the dopamine blocking medications as well as mood stabilizing or second messenger medications. And then obviously if they respond, great. So that might be your lamotrigine topiramate, that could be your aripiprazole or lanzapine. And let's say they're not responding at that point, then you will want to change to the other class. So if you start it with a mood stabilizer like toparamate or, or um, toparamate or lamotrigine, you would then switch to the antipsychotic like aripiprazole, for example. Now for cognition and perceptions, you really want to go with the atypical antipsychotic or second generation dopamine blocking medication. And if they respond, great. If the patient doesn't respond, then you can consider changing to a different atypical dopamine blocking medication or second generation antipsychotic. And for the affective component, you're going to go with the mood stabilizer. If the patient responds, great, you can continue the mood stabilizer. If not, you're going to go with the second generation um, dopamine blocking medication, okay? So you wanna kind of break this down based on the symptoms, but if you can see even from this decision-making algorithm that it's probably best to just go with the mood stabilizer initially as that is going to be the most likely to target majority of the symptoms that are potentially targetable with this me with medication, and it's the one that seems to have the largest effect size overall. I also want to offer you guys this stepped care for borderline personality disorder algorithm. So this is broken down into different categories. There's a preclinical category, there's an early mild, there's a sustained moderate, a severe, and a chronic persistent as the, as the step categories, and then there's severity, the definition, and of course the potential interventions. So in the preclinical pre stages, your subthreshold in terms of your severity, meaning you're most likely not necessarily coming to a psychiatrist at that point, but you're at increased risk for developing borderline personality disorder. And some of the things that we know increase the risk are a family history of borderline personality disorder. So a genetic component, childhood adversity, or what I like to term early um, adverse childhood events. This has been a big topic in psychiatry that adverse childhood events lead to the development of not only personality disorders, but other psychiatric disorders and medical disorders as well. There's mild or non-specific self-regulation problems with this person. And of course, they're going to potentially have self-harm, but not suicidality. For this person, the best thing to do with the interventions is psychoeducation for the patient and their families. So telling them, look, this is what borderline personality disorder is. This is how it's treated, et cetera, et cetera. So educate them about the diagnosis and treatment and focus on supportive counseling and problem solving. So you're not gonna really do like a specific type of therapy and you're not really going to add any medication as you can see in the preclinical pre stages. Now, early mild stages, so you have your first episode of subthreshold BPD, 
Now you have positive self-harm, let's say, but not suicidality. That's where you wanna go with the good psychiatric management. You wanna get a case manager involved and you might want to engage in a DBT skills group if you can find one. In the sustained moderate category, so sustained threshold level symptoms, this person is unresponsive to basic treatment. So you've already tried, say, the DBT skills group. You've tried case management, psychoeducation, supportive, supportive psychotherapy, and the person is unresponsive to those treatments. And now they have self-harm plus suicidal gestures or parasuicidal behaviors. Now you need to do good psychiatric management with medication management as well. This is where you start to see medication creeping into the treatment algorithm. You wanna do DBT skills training, both on an individual and group level. And you might want to do something like DBT, obviously, or mentalization-based therapy, or transference-focused psychotherapy. Either of those three are good options, but good luck finding someone who does them. In the severe cases, again, the difference mostly being here is that there might be a potentially fatal suicide attempt. So in the severe symptoms, we're thinking that the person had like a serious overdose attempt. Maybe they ended up in the ICU. Maybe they ended up hospitalized on an inpatient psychiatric facility. So they need a higher level of care. They may, may need residential or what we call an intensive outpatient or a mental health intensive outpatient program. And they may also require medication management at that time as well. So again, this is where medication may play a role. And then of course, there's the chronic persistent at the bottom here. So this is an unremitting disorder, unresponsive to intervention at all. So it's unresponsive to any of the interventions. Here, you wanna go with good, good psychiatric management, but also supportive psychotherapy. These patients probably plus or minus uh, medications as if they're unresponsive to medications prior to that, they're not likely going to find one. And this might be the case where you find the patient on, you know, four or five medications plus PRNs. And not only do they have four or five medications, they have uh, every class of medication. So the joke in psychiatry is that this is called a borderline cocktail and the borderline cocktail consists of an antidepressant, an antipsychotic, a mood stabilizer. And then maybe throw in a benzodiazepine or something else there to kind of round it all off. All right, so I'm gonna wrap the video here. We're gonna put it all together one last time to give you guys the upshot. So if this is the only part of the video you watch, then at least you'll know what the classes of medication are that are most effective. So let's start with the antipsychotics. Antipsychotics have a moderate effect size, meaning it's pretty good, not great, but better than nothing in terms of cognitive impa impairment. So it improves cognitive function, it improves perceptual symptoms. So, and it also has a major effect on anger. So antipsychotics, major effect on anger, and a moderate effect on cognitive and perceptual symptoms. So again, not a bad choice if you're going to get, you're going to target multiple symptom clusters there, and it could be beneficial for many patients. Antidepressants, no effect on depression and impulsivity, but may decrease anxiety and suicidal behavior. So really antidepressants, I, I'd say, are the maybe the least useful and maybe the thing you go to last if nothing else is, is working just to see if maybe it will, again, affect the anxiety component or suicidal behavior of the patient. But for the most part, there's no effect and it's not a great choice. Finally, the mood stabilizing medication, they have a large effect size. So this is a good medication if the person is presenting with impulsivity, behavioral discontrol, anger, anxiety, and it even has some effect on depression. So overall, the mood stabilizers have the largest global functioning effect for borderline personality disorder. So I guess what I can say here is that the most bang for your buck is gonna be with mood stabilizing medications. That should probably be your starting point. And lamotrigine and topiramate seem to be the ones that have the most research surrounding them. However, things like divalproix can also be beneficial as well as carbamazepine. After that, I would say it's the antipsychotics or dopamine blocking medications that come in second place overall, because again, they will target multiple symptoms of, uh, that can arise with borderline personality disorder, and specifically the ones like anger, perceptual disturbances, and cognitive dysfunction, which can cause significant functional impairment for the patient. So antipsychotics in second place, and then somewhere at the bottom is antidepressants. I really don't think they have much benefit here. However, you know, again, maybe for that anxiety, if there's like a severe anxiety, you might get some value from them.
So I'm going to hold the video there. I'm going to wrap it there. Thanks for watching. And if you guys can, please like and subscribe to the channel. It helps me to keep making these videos and get, giving you guys good content so we can make psychiatry great.